sent to 2, 2 gets sent to 4, 4 gets sent to 3, and 3 gets sent back to 1. And so what's cool, and this is what creates the canonic structure, because when we do this, to this, when we do our voice leading to this chord, we end up here. And then when we do that again, we end up at a different chord. And then when we do that again, we end up at a different chord. And as we do this, because of the cycle on the voices, each voice goes through the same melodic sequence. Okay? So, anyone want to ask a question? So in this particular example, what yeah. is the sequence you end up with? Ah, great. Next slide. <laughs> so let me tell you a story. When I was making my big database, I analyzed every single Bach chorale. The 371 of them, 20,000 chords, all that stuff. And one night I was idly um, proofreading and looking through. I started looking at this chorale. I noticed something and I was like, whoa, that's weird. This voice leading gets repeated again. This voice leading gets, and then as I looked and looked and looked, I realized that in this totally unremarkable little piece of music by Bach that was, you know, this not in any way singled out from any of the other music that he had ever written, Bach had incredibly artfully hidden a canon that probably nobody had ever noticed except for me, and, and Bach. <laughs> and so I noticed this at 10.30, and by 11.30 I worked out the whole theory of how, of how this had all worked. And of course I got no sleep that night. And it was one of the few cases where work-induced insomnia was completely welcome, and I wasn't at all pissed off. I was just so happy that me and Bach shared this secret. That, okay, so here is the pattern. Basically, Bach adds a little passing note into each of these. So the, the voice, the pattern, produced by iterating the voice leading is, okay, that is the pattern. But Bach fills it in, and so there it is. You can see the pattern starting first on C, second on G, third on D, fourth on A, and I will play it for you, and you might actually be able to hear it. This is chorale number 115. Changes the scale a little bit, but this is this is exactly a can. All right. Now the amazing thing is box chorale. Okay, anyone can write that can, but Bach is working with a pre-existing melody, right? A Lutheran hymn that he is setting, and so he. The thing that was so astonishing to me is the contortions that he engages in to get this canonic structure to fit over this pre-existing melody, which does not necessarily call for the structure in any way, and I'll just play the actual chorale. Okay, so it's, you can probably hear a family resemblance between these two things. Um, and I have a whole long story, which when I give this talk to musicians, I explain exactly how, what he switches and how he changes and everything. And by the end of that story, people are usually very impressed with my analytical ingenuity, but they are left a little bit concerned about whether I'm just kind of torturing things to tell a funny story, at which point, having done that, I show them that Bach does this several other times in the chorale. So one time is maybe a coincidence, but the fact that he does it over and over and over again, I think, is, is pretty clear evidence that he knew that this particular voice leading pattern generated a canon, and at various points he tries to see how far he can push this voice leading pattern, how, how much he can keep reusing it or close variants of it. Okay, here's another good example. This is actually, in a way, it's a sub-canon of the Bach voice leading. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to really play through these. There is a simple ascending arpeggio that can be that gives rise to a family of closely related canonic voice leadings. This one is the most like box in that it rises through musical space. This one just stays fixed in musical space. This one kind of produces a series of, uh, it's always just a single note. So, but they all use the same, three of their four melodic intervals are the same. And the amazing thing is you can put them together in, in fun ways to, to to sort of embed this family of canons within themselves. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because there's a beautiful Renaissance madrigal by the composer Luca Morenzio, who, uh, the, the piece, is, it's, a, it's called, um, 
I dispiatat a morte, and it's a terrible death. And the lover is singing to his beloved who has died about how horrible death is. And she's gone, and it's a very chord-based piece of music, and he gets to the part where he says, I cannot follow. You have gone, and I cannot follow. And of course, all these canonic patterns suddenly come out, and the music is showing you. And basically, the music is embodying the human fantasy of overcoming death. Right at the time that the words are saying this can't be done. I'm going to just play this for you. And it's like three minutes long, and when we get to this point, uh, I will point it out. And it all goes by very quickly, and you would never notice it. But again, here is this ancient myth between, uh, this ancient metaphor of the idea of a musical canon and the human idea of following you know, it, as applied to the fantasy of, of, of uh, dodging death. And it's a very just... It's a wonderful moment uh, because it's great music, it's extremely expressive, it's about very important things, and it's got this kind of wonderful mathematical thinking buried inside it. You're not at all obvious, but, but you know that the composer was quite pleased at himself in the artful way he combined all these closely related canonic voice leadings and so on. So I'll just play this. gives us a very precise way of talking about exactly what's going on here and of communing with this long dead, uh, you know, quasi-mathematical composer and understanding exactly uh, what was happening here. Very quickly, here's another kind of voice leading you might want to uh, uh, theorize about. This is maybe the basic pattern uh, in stride piano, a kind of jazz. I really wish this were louder. Bass goes down by fifths. Upper voices move down by semitone. When you look at it, this is something that should not be happening. <laughs> the left hand is moving by giant steps, going down seven keys each time. The right hand is moving down by semitone. And yet, these chords, by rights, if the, if the different parts of the chord are moving by different amounts, you should be just getting different harmonies and random sort of crunches and it shouldn't be sounding good after a certain point. The harmony is always the same. Okay, and that has to, yes, exactly, that has to do with the fact that there's a subgroup in here and so on. So these are what I call oblique voice leadings where it's again, it's an interesting kind of voice leading that you can theorize about because what's going on here is that one kind of uh, part of the chord is moving in one way, and the other part of the chord is moving the other way, but it always retains the same harmonic structure. Now, I could give a whole, you know, three-hour seminar where I go through the history of music and talk about uh, the different ways composers have explored this idea. Basically, you can see what's happening here because there is a this tritone is basically, these are antipodal points on the circle, so you can wrote, move them by half a turn without changing the harmony. And so basically you can see this as your, your deeper structure, and then you just move it to create the, the different patterns here. So um, among the places, among the composers who were fascinated with this, Stravinsky in the Rite of Spring, 
plays with this on two separate occasions. Jazz arrangers use it uh, all over the place. I have a whole story about rock harmony and how some of the basic patterns of rock harmony not only use this strategy here, but also create the kind of canons that we found in Marenzio. And so uh, I give a little lecture about how Neil Young's uh, song Helpless or the Beatles song Eight Days a Week encode a hidden canon within them. And when I give the talk to musicians, I make them sing the canon and sometimes at the same time that the music is playing. So this is just another example of a kind of math theory that you can do about uh, voice leading. But now I'm going to finally get to geometry. So chords, it turns out, correspond to, but basically the whole trick here is to think of the configuration space of unordered points on the circle when duplicates are allowed. Okay, and so what you do is you start, okay, ordered points on the piano, that gives you Rn, right? Uh, so you can think of that, that is the space where we care about what octave notes are in and what instrument is playing them. When we no ignore octaves, we go to the n-dimensional torus, but we still care about which instrument is playing what. And then um, when we decide not to care about which instrument is playing what, we have to quotient the n torus by the uh, symmetric group of order n, and that creates an orbifold. It's still a nice flat high school geometry uh, Euclidean space, other than the singularities. Okay, so it turns out that chords correspond to points in an orbifold. Voice leadings can be thought of either as vectors in the space or as classes of paths through the space. From the standpoint of visualizing these spaces, the path representation is maybe more um, is more useful, more fun, but the vector concept is an important one, and I think probably most mathematicians would prefer to think in that way. And then it turns out that a musical scale is really quite closely analogous to a metric on the circle, right? Basically the scale teaches us how to go up one. So it's a way of measuring distance on the circle, and different scales correspond to different ways of measuring distance. So the amazing thing is you have a kind of translation manual that is idiomatic on both sides. So pretty much the way that you want as a musician to talk about chords and voice leadings and scales is entirely compatible with the way that you mathematicians are comfortable talking about orbifolds and vectors or, or classes of paths and metrics. Okay, And so uh, basically the spaces I am interested in musically all obey what I call the golden rule, which is that in these spaces, every point represents a chord, and every generalized line segment represents a voice leading, right? So there's, uh, the spaces I care about are, are spaces that both represent voice leading with the distance of the line segment mapping onto the size of the voice leading, and, um, and so if you do this right, you can get a wonderful collection of musical spaces that show you different sort of, uh, show you musical possibilities that we formerly knew only by playing on the keyboard. And really the key to making all this work is the idea of a voice leading translating into specific paths and specific vectors. And so this is all made possible by having a kind of formal theory of a voice leading. Okay, the geometry could only be realized if we had a robust understanding of uh, voice leadings. Now just to be clear, um, there are a huge number of equivalence classes that musicians habitually use, and so these give rise to a broad family of quotient spaces, each representing uh, different musical situations. So two notes, two note music where you don't care about octave or order, that lives on a kind of singular Mobius strip. Uh, three note uh, three note chord space, when you are modding out by octave in order, that lives in a twisted triangular torus whose boundaries are singular and so on. But you can go even farther, you can remove translation or rotation on the circle. Here's the space of two note types of chords. It's basically another orbifold with singular points at the, uh, uh, at the ends. Mathematically, this is the configuration space of two points on the circle uh, where two indistinguishable points on the circle where you're modding out by rotation. And so vectors on this space get represented by uh, paths that might bounce off the singularity in return. I have, I can, we can animate this if you want to. Here's the Mobius strip that represents two-dimensional uh, two-note chords. 
Um, this was the first of these spaces that I found. Here's a voice leading being represented as a vector or a path. This is the resolving tritone. All the wonderful things that geometers have talked about, like the fact that you can't uh, uniquely transport vectors from one point in the space to another. Uh, um, these have musical analogs. Here the fact that you can move a tritone in different ways so that it resolves in two different directions. So both of these vectors are translations of these vectors and all sorts of just sort of uh, totally standard um, differential geometry kind of uh, uh, stuff um, comes into play. So what can you do with the geometry? Well, the coolest thing is build sculptures and other artworks. This is a sculpture from the Museum of Mathematics in Manhattan. This is the space of three indistinguishable points on the circle uh, modding out by rotation, otherwise known as the space of three note chord types. And so this is a, this is each of these balls, this is a very bad projection. And that's me in a tuxedo on opening night. And uh, I got to listen to Stephen Wolfram tell me his theories about the universe. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, the tip is the augmented triad. Down here is chromatic clusters. And um, each of these is a theremin. So you can actually, a theremin is, you can go touch it, and then hear the chord that you're touching. And so uh, I like, I, if I had my choice, I'd call this the music of the spherical quotients. And uh, um, so other things you can do are use this powerful mapping to geometry to answer deep questions about the nature of music. Like in my book, I talk about under what conditions is it possible to link similar sounding harmonies by small voice leads. You can think of this as like the basic essence of tonality, and, and you can kind of turn it into a math problem. And the answer can be given in terms of the twists and the singularities of these configuration spaces. Uh, we can also take these geometries, translate musical notation into geometrical paths, and make manifest logic that was hidden um, um, when we looked at it in traditional notation. So in my book, I give uh, analyses of the very famous Chopin E minor prelude, which turns out to move very systematically through a lattice of four-dimensional cubes, and uh, Debussy's Le Joyeuse, which uh, engages in very similar kind of exploration of a, a higher dimensional space of scales. I should say that for me, you know, there's a two note, for me you can have a one note chord, two note chords, three note chords, seven note chords are just, uh, are what we typically think of as musical scales, but I just think of them as higher dimensional chords. So we can understand the origin of many seemingly independent graphical depictions of musical structure. When I was young, there were all these graphical models proliferating that would model tiny little corners of musical possibility. And it turns out that they are all, um, they are basically all, uh, they all belong to the same overarching family of voice leading spaces, which we can now um, characterize. So, and then finally, the last thing I'll say, uh, and, and you know, periodically I meet resistance to, to this, because I'll show people this wonderful four-dimensional space that shows how four-note chords relate, and I'll show, oh, wow, isn't it cool? You can see all this wonderful structure in Chopin, and someone will look at me and say, yeah, but you don't need the geometry to do that. And I will say, right, by obviously, because Chopin didn't know four-dimensional geometry, and nobody at Chopin's time knew four-dimensional singular geometry, and, and then people of a certain practical bent will say, well, so what's the point of all this stuff? And I'll say, well, you can do new stuff that Chopin maybe couldn't, and you can understand all and, and the thing is, that's all wrong. Because what I do is very similar to what you do, which is explore the intrinsic beauty of these structures. And the fact is, once you realize that there is this wonderful, rigorous translation from the musical domain to the geometrical domain, and that these are two equivalent representations of the same structure. And that you can literally know four-dimensional geometry by sitting at a piano keyboard and playing with, uh, four with you know, the chords you can make with four fingers. That is a sublime and profound and really beautiful realization. And it may not be as powerful and abstract as the kinds of things that mathematicians do in the 21st century. But it's, it's, it, I, I believe in it. And so I'm ending this with a little, um, you know, uh, 
a little bit of a, I want to fight back and say, say that no, the, the whole point of, certain, of this kind of intellectual endeavor is to have an experience of beauty that relates to powerful structures that reappear in all sorts of places you wouldn't expect, like Luca Morenzio's Madrigals about death. And, um, and, and, and I don't necessarily think we should be in the business of justifying that aesthetic, uh, scientific, mathematical, music theoretical experience on the basis of uh, practical utility. So, but for me, maybe the most sort of sublime, profound uh, realization is that I can suddenly start to appreciate in many cases how composers' choices are constrained by the logico-geometrical structure of the musical possibility. Okay, so what can you do with voice leading, uh, formal theory of voice leading? You can count them. We gave a couple of examples of that. We can theorize them and we can use them to define a true geometry of chords and chord types. Thank you, everybody.